All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 2. The title of this message this morning, once again, is Under God's Anointing. This is session four. We're talking about what it means, what it's like, what are the evidences of living under God's anointing. Hallelujah. So we've been looking at it the last few weeks. We know that one who lives under God's anointing, there are evidences of that. They're connected to God. They, things come from that. There is a joy. There is an overwhelming. There is a spilling over. There is wonders that take place in a person's life when they live under the anointing of God. We're going to continue to look at Paul's life as he lived under that anointing and what it can mean for us here this morning. So before we begin to read scripture, please listen now to this first assertion. And that is that a person who lives under God's anointing will engage themselves in cognitive correction. So a person who lives under God's anointing will engage themselves. They have the ability. They have the skill. They, on purpose, want to engage in cognitive correction. That means that we change the way we think. That means that I look at a circumstance and I perceive it from my own person and how I'm responding or how I'm re reacting to this circumstance and how it makes me feel. I have the emotions that it, it stirs up inside me. All emotions come from thoughts, subconscious thoughts. And a person who lives under God's anointing approaches these circumstances from the perspective that how it makes me feel, how I'm reacting to it, I don't like it. It's not right. It's out of God's will. Okay? For a person to be angry, mad, upset, stressed out, discouraged, frustrated, disappointed, in depression, that, that's out of being, that's out of God's will. That's not God's will for our lives. But that doesn't come from the Lord. And so we see here where the Paul, when we begin to read this scripture, that Paul had the ability to engage himself in cognitive correction. So let's pick it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and beginning with verse 1. Now listen to each word as we read this. So Paul says, but I determined within myself. Say, that right there tells you that Paul is engaging in cognitive correction. Now, this is about the Corinthian church. First of all, just a little bit of history so we understand where Paul's coming from. The Corinthian church was mainly made up of Greeks, Greek Christians, and Jewish Christians, and proselytes, people who necessarily weren't of the Jewish faith, but adopted the Jewish faith as their faith. We call them proselytes. Okay? And so you had the Corinthian church that was made up of, of almost... Different, many different cultures, different kinds of people. And we know that the Greeks, well, they can be stubborn at times. I know that because my parents, my dad was extremely stubborn at times. Okay? And they were deep thinkers, and they took a lot of pride in their philosophy. They took, took a lot of pride in the physical body. And because of that, as they came into the faith of Jesus Christ, many things now were taking place in the Corinthian church that were out of order. And I don't preach this to us here this morning to preach that you know our church or the church is out of order. That's not why we're looking at this this morning, but we're looking at it from the perspective of how Paul reacted to certain things within the ministry in his life, living under the anointing of God. And so in the first letter, in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses many of these issues that are out of order. Well, it helped a little bit, but things were still out of order and they weren't as they were supposed to be. They weren't as Paul wanted them to be. Let me tell you something, folks. There's few things in life 
that are the way you want them to be. <laughs> They're just not. Whether it's work, whether it's finances, whether it's family, whether it's relationships, whether it's God, whether it's church, whatever it might be, whether it's society, whether it's governments, whether it's education, it doesn't matter. There are very few things in life that really are exactly the way that you want them to be. And so Paul started the church in Corinth, and now things are way out of order. And so he's writing this second book of 2 Corinthians under the church to, to try to set them back in order, to try to put them back in place. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul came with a, with a heavy burden, and he came with a, with a rod, so to speak, and he was, he was aggressive towards the Christians. So many sinful things were taking place. They were, they were extremely lustful. The Greeks were proud of their physical bodies. They had, they had open baths. We know in Greece they had you know, open baths. The public would come. They had you know, open sexual orgies right in the middle of town. Uh, they were very flamboyant in, in their addressing the loss of their flesh. And that had filtrated into the church. Now Paul here in his first letter to Corinthians tried to set things in order. Now here in the second chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul's looking at all this and he's going, you know what? This is an unattainable burden. And remember I explained some time ago, the, and the unattainable burden is this. It's when I want something for somebody else more than they want it for themselves. That becomes an unattainable burden. In other words, I can't there comes a point in time where I can't solve that burden. It's never going to be met. I can't carry that anymore. And I have to come to a place where that I resolve within myself that I can't want it more for somebody else anymore than they want it for themselves. And this was Paul. So Paul says here now in verse 1, he says, but now I have thought much about this. And I've engaged myself in cognitive correction. And he explains it by saying, for I determined this within myself. Let me encourage you. I know some preachers and some people write that we don't wrestle with God, but I disagree with that. They, they say we wrestle with the devil, but we don't really wrestle with God. I disagree with that. I've wrestled with God my whole life. I wrestle with God every day, <laughs> you know. I mean, I wrestle with the Holy Spirit. Not wrestling like, <clears throat> but wrestling as far as probing to try to understand, to try to conceptualize what, what, what the will of God is, what the word of the Lord means, what, what the purpose is, what's the hidden mystery, what's the diadem that I haven't discovered yet that needs to come out of me that, so that the light will come on, so that the revelation of the word of God will manifest itself in me. And I think we have to wrestle with God to get to those places. I don't think you just get there automatically. Just, whoa, you know, we're just all happy go lucky. And we just happen to stumble on a mystery of God, you know, by accident. And, well, that's cool. And almost knocked us off our feet. And we get back up and we just continue on with our, you know, jolly go lucky lives. And we just hope we'll get another one sometime. I don't think it's that at all. I think we have to wrestle with God. I think we have to come before God and say, God, what is this? What's going on? Show me. Teach me. And this is Paul. Amen. He says, for I have determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. I am not going to come to you again, church, in heaviness. I no longer can bear that burden. That burden is no longer fruitful. That burden is no longer from God. That burden is now, if I don't resolve it, if I don't get over it. In other words, here it is, folks. Listen to this now. Paul knew for him to be effective now in teaching the Corinthian church. He had to get over himself and he had to get out of his way. Paul knew now to be effective in this next letter. He had to get over himself and he had to get himself out of the way for his teaching to be effective. Listen, folks, 
for the majority of the time, we restrict God's ways because we're trying to live it our ways. We're trying to fit God into our disappointments. Well, you know what? Okay, then I'm just going to shoot myself in the foot and that'll just teach God. You know, and then he'll have to do something. <laughs> so we, so we, we commit self-sabotage to try to persuade God to move, to do something, to be active, to, to feel something. I'm going to shoot myself in the leg. I'm going to, I'm going to cut myself so that I'll feel something because I, I just haven't felt anything for a long time. And we try to manipulate God with things that are completely out of God's will. Well, I'm quit this job so God will give me a new job. You ever done that one before? You know, when you're young and stupid, years and years and years ago, and well, I'm going to show my faith. I just know that this job, that God wants me to have this job. So I'm going to show my faith by quitting the job that I have and then just wait for God to give me that job because I deserve it. You know, and guess what? <laughs> the job never comes. And so you have to crawl back to your father-in-law and mother-in-law and ask them if you can live with them once again. And then the father-in-law and the mother-in-law go look at you and go, and go, you know what? I knew my daughter should never have married you because you're an idiot. And then you have to eat that crow because you thought you had faith in God. And you were going to show God that by faith, by quitting this job, and, and then, you know, hanging out for a couple of weeks until this other job happens and it doesn't happen and, and, then, and then you're stupid. You see, here Paul is saying, he, I knew, he says, I had to get out, I have to get out of my way and I have to get over myself. Let me tell you something, folks. A lot of people lose out with God because they can't get over themselves. They lose out with God because they can't get over themselves. They're too out front in it. It's too much about them. They lean upon their feelings rather than leaning upon their faith. You see, Paul is saying here to the Corinthian church, I'm now going to come to you and I'm going to minister to you from God's perspective and not just from mine. Folks, do we not need to see it from God's perspective and not from our own? Yes. You know what? We don't know how to solve the world's problems. Now, we know that much of it, the world's problems is a lack of God. We know that. But aside from that, I don't have the answers. Some of these things, you know, world affairs, I, don't even, I, I can't even think about them because it gives me a headache. I can't conceptualize how to, how to answer those problems, so I really don't even want to think about it. And you know what? If you ask me what my opinion is, I won't have one. Because frankly, I don't want one. It's, it's above my pay grade. You know what I'm saying? That's not, that's not where I'm supposed to be at. And I, I, I can't conceptualize it. I, and so what I need to do is, is that if, I can't, if I can't resolve my own issues here, my own real life issues, I have no business telling somebody else how to solve their issues. You know, it's amazing to me how that you know, people in government, especially over in Washington, D.C., and governors of states, they can't resolve their educational issues. They can't resolve their homeless issues. They can't resolve their drug addiction issues. But they think they know how to tell everybody else how to live. You know, they have no idea what, what to do, how to spend their money. But they know how to spend everyone else's money. You know what I'm saying? Listen, Christian people, it's crucial that we, that we approach everything in life from God's perspective. Amen. Listen, there's going to be times of great heaviness. Paul said here, Paul said, I'm sick and tired of feeling this way. I'm sick and tired of being heavy about you people in Corinth. I'm sick and tired of it, and I'm not going to come to you in heaviness anymore. Because the only way I can resolve my heaviness is come to you with a bat. And I know that's not God's will for me to beat you with a bat. Therefore, I got to get over myself and see it from God's perspective. Somebody say amen. You see, cognitive 
restructuring means I don't think like that anymore. I don't want to feel like that anymore. I've written curriculums on cognitive restructuring. I've taught it for years. And I gotta tell you, I use it every day. I use cognitive restructuring, that skill, that tool, every single day as I approach issues of life. Let's move on. Verse two, for if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? but the same which is made sorry by me. In other words, man, this is all mixed up. So if I come to you in heaviness and angry and then I make you angry and sad and then, then I'm now angry and sad, what profit is that? That's no good. So let's go to verse three. So then he says, and I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow. Now listen to this, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. He said, I'm coming unto you. Listen, when I came, I should have sorrow from them that I should be rejoicing with. Amen. In other words, I should come and find faith. And I, when I, if I come, I'm not going to find faith. And there are many of you that should be rejoicing. And when I come to you, I'm not going to rejoice with you because there's no rejoicing. You should be rejoicing. And he says, not only that, but it's all about joy. He says, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. So then Paul is saying this. He's asking the church, so where's your joy? Just let me ask a simple question. Where's the joy? Where's your joy? See? Now, not that it's lacking in any of us, but folks, it's crucial to understand that the deity importance of the joy of the Lord. Say amen. It's crucial to understand the significance of having the joy of the Lord. It doesn't mean we're always jumping up and down every day because we're so happy. In fact, happiness and joy can all be be competitive, competitive against one another. We're not talking about happiness. We're talking about the joy of the Lord. Now here are some significant things that are important about the joy of the Lord. First of all, listen to this. A person who lives under the anointing of the Lord's joy is rock solid. That person is rock solid. You see, no matter the beating of great storms of life, that person cannot be moved off of his solid rock. And the Corinthian church were wishy-washy. There wasn't anything solid about them. The only thing that was, you know, that was consistent about them was their inconsistency. And so Paul is getting after them saying, where is your joy? You see? And a person who lives under the anointing of the joy of the Lord is a rock-solid person. 